Hello everyone, my name is John Todor, and by the grace of God, I am a minister here at the First Baptist Church in the beautiful city of Casson, Minnesota. It is my great pleasure and honor on behalf of the Casson Manterville Ministerial Association to be welcoming all of you now to this online Community Good Friday service. For the next few minutes, ministers from our community are going to share with us the Word of God. They are going to open the scripture for us and they will be teaching us and sharing with us on the seven sayings that Jesus made on the cross. What a great opportunity and privilege it is for all of us now as followers of Jesus Christ to be able to come together and look back, reflect, and remember what happened on Calvary's cross more than 2,000 years ago. Would you please join me now as we come before the Lord in prayer and ask the Lord's blessing upon our time here together. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you because you are a good, good God. Thank you that you are the eternal one, the one who was and is and will always be. We thank you that you are our sustainer in this life. We thank you and we praise you because you are our provider. We thank you, Lord, today that more than 2,000 years ago, you have provided for us. You have given us your best in the person of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that all who believe in him, according to the scripture, will not perish but have everlasting life. We ask now your presence upon us today as we are going to be hearing from ministers from our community. We ask your blessing upon the entire service and we pray, Lord, that your word, once again, will fall on good ground, on receptive hearts, and that your word will bring forth fruit for your glory and honor. All of these things and so much more, we pray in the name of Jesus, the name above all names, and all God's people say, Amen and Amen. Good evening. Welcome to our uh, KM Ministerial Good Friday worship service. And I'm Lindsay Cowell. I'm the Director of Children, Youth, and Family Ministry at St. John's Lutheran Church here in Casson. Uh, and the words that I am speaking to today um, from Jesus' last words are Jesus' first Last words from Luke chapter 23, verse 34. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And we hear these words right after Jesus has been hung on the cross between two criminals. And I'm always struck by this particular verse because I think it's something that speaks to all of us. Uh, one of the things growing up that I really, really loved about Holy Week was Good Friday, which for a young person might seem a little odd, but I think that when we are young especially, and even as we get older, we realize how important forgiveness is. It's the thing that holds us together. It's the thing that repairs relationships when things are broken. Um, it's something that we do. We say we're sorry to one another and oftentimes, this is the thing I talk about with students a lot. We talk about how oftentimes when we say, I'm sorry to someone, we hear, it's okay, or no big deal, it's fine. But one of the things that I think that Jesus is reminding us of here in this passage as he is going forward to a horrible death on the cross is the importance of forgiveness. We are called as people of God into relationship, not only with God, but with one another. And one of the things that's important to relationships is 
coming together when we've hurt one another and to acknowledge that hurt. So it takes a lot for someone to say, I'm sorry. And Jesus is facing these people below him who've put him on a cross and there is no, I'm sorry. There's just mob mentality, violence and death. And what Jesus is speaking into the face of that is forgiveness. It's making things right. And so one of the things that I think as we go forward into this Lenten journey, as we finish our Lenten journey and we head into Easter and we think about the celebration of Christ's re resurrection, one of the things, just as in baptism, where we are drowned in death and, and baptized into a death like his, we are raised into a life like his. And so one of the things that I think as we head forward into the Easter season is to remind ourselves how important forgiveness is. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life of your son. We thank you and give thanks, especially for his words of forgiveness to those who put him to death on the cross. And we would ask that you would help us to remember how important forgiveness is here every day to make relationships right. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello, I'm Pastor Paul Thompson from East St. Olaf Lutheran Church of Byron and West St. Olaf Lutheran Church of Hayfield. Speaking of Jesus' second words from the cross, reading from Luke chapter 23. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding Jesus and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve from our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus said, today I will be with you in paradise. Not only bringing a criminal into paradise, but doing it that very day, that very time. I tell you, our day of salvation is today, is every day. Salvation is not something we wait for to happen at the end of time or at the end of our lives. Salvation is something we live in right here and now, knowing that we have a God willing to die for us to rise again for us so that we might rise. Our salvation is something we live. Our salvation is something we put into practice. Our salvation is something that we share with people around us by the love we have that reflects the love God first has for us. That day, that thief was with Jesus in paradise. That same Jesus prepares a place for us in his paradise and walks through our lives here, helping make this world a paradise as well. Greetings. I am the Reverend Alice May Applequist from St. Peter's Episcopal Church in Casson, Minnesota. Woman, behold your son, behold your mother. John, verses 26 and 27. Jesus looks out at the crowd and he sees his mother and standing beside her is his beloved disciple, John. John, in those last few moments, Jesus calls out to John and then looks at his mother and says, woman, behold your son. And then he calls to John and said, behold your mother. This was his final act of pure devotion to entrust the care of his mother to his very closest friend. He knew that John would provide for her and protect her in his absence. Jesus' first two statements, they showed his divine side, his power to forgive sin and grant eternal salvation. But in this statement, in verses three, his power to forgive is not what's on his mind. It is truly He's showing his human side, fully God, fully man. Jesus' concern for Mary 
It was not that of being a savior. It was of being a son. Jesus's words were of care, of compassion, compassion and love for his mother. And that reminds us that Jesus also cares for us, our well-being, our direction in life. Even when we don't understand God's plan, we know that Jesus is with us. And so it is that as Jesus asked John to care for Mary, he asks us, you and I, to care for one another on his behalf. Peace be with you, my friend. Let us love one another. Good Friday blessings to you. My name is Pete Wietenbach, one of the pastors at South Zumbra Lutheran Church here in Casson. What an honor it is to be able to share a message with you alongside my brothers and sisters in Christ in the KM ministerial team. Reverend Alice May Applequist just shared with you about what Jesus had said to his mother and John. And I would like to move into Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, and Mark chapter 15, verse 34. Both Gospels share the same message. We learned that at three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is a direct quote of Psalm 22, verse 1, in which the psalmist writes the same words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? but goes on to write, why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? You can see here that in Psalm 22, we're given a few more phrases, another line, and you can assume that Jesus was probably thinking and feeling the same words, why are you so far from saving me? You see, in this moment, and I'll remind you that Jesus, fully man, he had to have felt so far from anyone. You see, the word forsaken literally means that, to be far from, to be deserted. He'd been tortured and beaten by the men that are below him. And yet in this moment, he feels so far from his father. In fact, though he's quoting that verse from Psalm 22, he is truly living those words, feeling forsaken, feeling so far from. Imagine that horror, the horror that he was experiencing. As it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In that moment, crying out to his father as he was nailed to a cross, begging his father, asking him why he was so far, we see the proof of Jesus being a man on the cross, yet remaining true to his father's will, even in a moment of such loneliness. On this Good Friday, may you understand the depth of the love that your father has for you, that he sent his son to be nailed to a cross and to have to live through those feelings and to live out feeling forsaken because he loves you that much. May you be blessed. May you reflect on the depth of his love for you this Good Friday. God bless you. Hi there. I'm Mark Olson, and I had the privilege of serving as pastor at Mount Zion Lutheran in Casson, in Zion Lutheran of rural Dexter. And I wanted to invite you to spend a couple of minutes with me in one of my favorite places, right by the Zumbro River. And I've enjoyed the Zumbro River in, in all the seasons of the year, during the winter, during the spring, summer, and fall. I, I've walked beside it. I've kayaked down it, and I've seen uh, numerous animals, God's creatures, come to it thirsty and be sustained by, by the water that brings life. 
As Jesus hung on the cross during his redemption mission, during those final hours, over 20 Old Testament scriptures were fulfilled. And we, we come to his words, some of his final words recorded in John 19, verse 28. It says there that knowing that everything had now been finished, so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. This was a, a fulfillment of one more Old Testament prophecy from, from Psalm 22, verse 15. Jesus had fully emptied himself. He had suffered in all ways. And, and now as his as it said in Psalm 22, his tongue stuck to the roof of his mouth. He was being ready to be laid down in the dust of death. He had, he had one more statement that he needed to make, one of victory, one to remind all that, that everything was finished. And so he, he received some wine in the form of vinegar, and it was put on a sponge, on a stick, and his lips and his tongue and his mouth was moistened. And finally, as he emptied himself, he would be ready to declare, it is finished. In Isaiah 12, verse 3, we, we hear the words, Come, you who are thirsty, and drink with joy draw water from the wells of salvation. Jesus said in John 7, verses 37 and 38, If anyone thirsts, come to me and drink. Anyone who believes in me, out of your heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus is the, the source of life eternal. And so the invitation is to come you who are thirsty, God bless. Hello, I'm Pastor John Weisenberger, and I'm at St. John's Lutheran Church in Casson. And it is my pleasure to bring you the sixth word from the cross when Jesus says it is finished. And we find it in the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 30. Right before that, Jesus has taken that drink. He said, I'm thirsty, and he's taken the drink of hyssop, vinegar, and wine from the soldiers. And then it says this in, in verse 30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So this is actually the last thing that Jesus says in the Gospel of John before he dies. And, you know, oftentimes when I've watched maybe a movie about Jesus' death on the cross, the way that Jesus speaks these words, it is finished, is oftentimes seemingly like dejected, defeated, like he's just barely holding on and just, you know, it's, it's finished, that, that sort of emotional sense of things. But I think if we look at the word closely, the word is uh, tetelestai or tetelestai in Greek, it can have a lot of meanings, but most of the meanings for that word are um, it's completed, it's accomplished, it's fulfilled. There's a sense of, of more that Jesus is celebrating that he has um, kind of run the race and completed this thing. So um, I, think, I think my sense of how Jesus speaks these words from the movies is maybe different than how he actually says them. And we get in a, a better sense if we go backwards in John's gospel. In chapter 4, verse 34, the disciples bring Jesus some food and he says to them, um, well, the food that I eat is the, to do the will of the one who sent me and to complete his work. So right from the beginning, Jesus is setting up the sense of doing this work and bringing it to completion. And in chapter 17, when he's praying at the Last Supper with the disciples, there's a very long prayer in John's Gospel. And in that prayer, he speaks to God and says, I am now completing the work you gave me to do. So the centerpiece of Jesus' ministry here is 
is doing the work that God sent him to do, which is preaching the good news of the gospel, healing, teaching, preaching, bringing the disciples together into community, and then finally to give up his life on the cross as that atonement for our sins to bring peace and forgiveness between us and God and uh, entrance into the kingdom, to bring God's kingdom fully to us as the children of God. So that's what we celebrate this Good Friday and um, just like to bring that sense of Jesus this stating the, his completion of his work. So let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your work on the cross. We celebrate this on this Good Friday, that you have broken down every barrier between us and our loving Father. And so we thank you for that work on the cross and we pray in your holy name. Amen. Thank you. Good evening, beloved. I'm Pastor Jacob Hansen from Casson and Pleasant Corners United Methodist Churches. The final words of Christ spoken upon the cross come from Luke 23, verse 46. It reads, And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. These are the last words upon the cross. These are the last words Jesus speaks on this side of the grave, and upon speaking these final few words, he willingly, willingly gives up his spirit. After all of the torture, the humiliation, after all of the struggle, Jesus is still in control. He is still God. No one can take his life from him. He yields it up for the sake of any and all who would call upon his name. In fact, nothing up till this point has happened without Jesus's say so. What to the world looks insane to Jesus is a part of this plan. Judas's betrayal, the false trials before the Pharisees, the false trial before Pontius Pilate and Herod, and even the humiliation, and now his death upon the cross are all a part of this plan to save mankind, to save humanity, to save you and me from sins. By the time we reach this, his ministry is done. His ministry on this, this side of the tomb is finished by the time we get to Luke 23. He's taught everything he's going to teach. He's preached everything he's going to preach. All the miracles that he's going to perform are done. All of the prophecies are fulfilled. There's only one thing left for Jesus to do on this side of the tomb. And his words claiming that it is finished are true. He's completed his ministry. And the only thing left is to die. That's all that's left for Jesus to complete his salvific work. And willingly, by his own choice, he finally fulfills his ministry, giving up his life for the sake of sinful man. He dies so that you and I might live. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come before you on this Good Friday, and we remember the sacrifice. We remember, Lord, how we are healed, not by our own hands, not by our own good actions, but by his stripes, his wounds. Thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross in our stead. Thank you, Jesus, for your wonderful and mighty plan to save us. We love you. We trust you. We remember what it cost, and we glory in the cross and in the empty tomb. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Hi, y'all. I'm Pastor Paul from Stonebridge Community Church. I'm sure y'all recognize where I am here at Goat Island Bridge in Manorville. I love coming here just to think, to contemplate, to think about all God has done. And today, Christians around the world are gathering in churches, in their homes, in their, in their communities to remember what Christ did on the cross at Golgotha all of those years ago, almost 2,000 years, for each and every one of us, that sacrifice that he made, the sacrifice that none of us could have made, the payment that none of us could have made for our sins. He was tried, he was found guilty, and he was tortured. Then he was made to carry that cross. He was nailed to it. Then he was hung from it on display for all to see. 
Now he died. His life and his death had fulfilled the prophecies of the coming Messiah. Yet he was rejected and turned away from by the very people who had celebrated his entry not that many days before. Even his disciples fled, leaving only John there with him in the end. Today, as we remember this day, this Good Friday, as we wait to celebrate his resurrection on Sunday, I encourage you to take a moment and pray. Remember his work in each of us, the, the work that he is doing, preparing your heart. The sacrifice that he made that we were unable to make. So that as, as a fee, Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for we are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from ourselves. It is God's gift, not from works so that no one can boast. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, your glory is great. We are broken sinners and we thank you for your sacrifice on the cross so long ago. Thank you for the gift of grace that we do not deserve and can never repay. Help us to love you well and to love others well, giving you all the glory. Give us opportunities to share you with our neighbors and to love them well, but also to tell them about the works that you have done in us, in our lives, but also for them. Help us to be a light in the world, as Jesus has commanded us to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. Give us the courage to step out of our comfort zones, the wisdom to share your truth, and the love to care for others well. In the name of your Son, we pray. Amen. Now, if you don't have a church home or you haven't chosen where to go on Sunday morning, we encourage you, we invite you, we implore that you would come and join any of us in any of our churches and come and celebrate the risen King with us on Sunday morning. Just look us up online in your newspaper and come and celebrate.